Hey there, welcome to CNT Collectibles IMC. Hope you're doing well. All right, we'll continue on with our player preview series with uh, Nate Lau. Nathaniel Lau came over from the Tampa Bay Rays straight into the Texas Rangers and had a really terrific season. And so uh, what we want to do here is just highlight a few players that are a little bit more under the radar. They didn't quite make my long-term Hall of Fame tracker for one way or another, but they sure deserve to be talked about. So we'll take a little more in-depth look at uh, at some of those guys. And, and this week, uh, again, it's the Texas first baseman. So uh, he is a 27-year-old, uh, just finished his uh, year 20, his year 26, age 26 season. Uh, January 1st-ish, or excuse me, July 1st is just kind of the cutoff for that one. So uh, not the oldest player ever, but uh, got a little bit of a, a late start overall. But gosh, he's sure putting it together here. So last year, 27 home runs. 302 average, 143 weighted runs created, added three wins above replacement to his game at first base. It is difficult to add that war unless you are a monster with the bat. He's very, very good with the bat, but the defense sure, sure held him back. And uh, and, and overall, he was a, uh, a regarded prospect in the power department with a decent hit tool. Again, that fielding and that speed held him back. And so when you look at the future value of some of these guys, he's a 45-plus future value. A lot of people might discount him overall. But again, when you look at that hit and that power, he could become fantasy and hobby relevant. And uh, in, in one case, he, he certainly is. Hobby, not so much. And so we'll try to figure out whether he's... He's worth a, a, a long-term uh, a piece of your portfolio here. So anyways, um, again, 27 home runs for the year. Reasonable strikeout rate for someone with some power. 22% strikeout rate. Like to see those walks get into the double digits last year. Not so much, but he has done that in the past. He had a very high bat at batting average on balls in play. Uh, higher than he's had in the past. That led to the three... 02 average and so uh, we could see some regression heading into next year again the speediest guys are the ones that tend to carry the highest babips he is not that and so if we saw uh, uh, some regression in that area drag the average down that uh, that that would be uh, that would not be um, unsurprising so uh, his, he's around a 260, 270 hitter without the inflated batting average and balls in play. But uh, you know what? He did it last year. worked out great. Just be mindful of that heading into fantasy drafts or when buying his cards if he has a hot preseason, all that kind of stuff here. Weight runs created, 143. We'll take a look at where that fit in with the rest of the league a little bit later here. Stat cast. He's been a very, very consistent player overall. Exit velocity, maximum exit velocity. Right in line what he's done historically. So uh, off a touch from the highs of his first um, two years, a short in 2020 season but not not out of the realm of uh impossibility or anything like that he lifted the ball a little bit more consistently last year uh he had a uh smaller sample size you would say in 2019 and 2020 so you know last year was really the first year we kind of get a gauge for things and he was putting the ball into, into the air a little bit more and with that exit velocity um you would expect more home runs and that's what he did he got that career high of 27 barreled the ball up at a very uh, consistent rate again throw those first two years or at least to take them with a grain of salt and so the last couple years pretty consistent the hard hit percentage has been fairly consistent as well uh he's hitting uh he's hitting some more uh, you know the line drives again up a little bit from last year down a little bit from his his peak years the fly ball rate again with lifting the ball in that launch angle is up a tick uh, over last year and the home run to fly ball rate uh, cropped up there a bit so there's room for him to actually increase that uh, you, the the big power hitters are looking. You're looking at 25, 30 percent home run fly ball rate. Or extreme rates would be 35, 40 percent, um, which definitely signals some regression for the most part. But um, you know, at that 19 percent, um, 20 percent, call it. Now it's not a bad number. And he can absolutely keep that up with his uh, with his power profile, and he, he does make good contact, and he he lifts the ball pretty well. So uh, again, he could have a, a regression in batting average while maintaining some of the uh, some of the power. Last year, he did start swinging at more balls outside the zone than he has in the past. We don't like to see that number creep up much above thirty percent, but he got up uh, close to thirty five percent on that uh, outside the zone swing percentage. Uh, swung more inside the zone as well. He's just swinging more in zen in in, uh, in general. So you can see that in the swing percentage overall. 50 52% of all balls he was he was swinging at and that's up from the uh, the low to mid 40s uh, he's making relatively good contact on that uh in the inside the zone here 85% which is roughly what he did last year um swinging strikes up just a little bit and that's going to happen when you swing in more balls especially more balls outside the zone and the called strikes uh, decreased from 16% last year down to 13%. So he's being a little bit more aggressive. And last year it worked out on that batting average and balls in play. You might be playing with fire if you're looking for the, uh, the, the that those metrics to repeat themselves. However, he does hit the ball to all fields. 
uh, doubles, triples, home runs, doesn't matter. He spreads the ball around. That is a great sign for hitters if you're able to use all fields. Uh, tough to play uh, overweighted defense or anything like that on a player who can uh, who can go with the pitch, and so that is a very good sign. So not saying that, uh, gosh, he's not capable of hitting 300. He sure is the way he's spreading the ball around. Just seems like last year was a lot was relatively fluky. A few things will have to change if he wants to to repeat that. He's not going to have to. He can't rely on the. Uh, the 360 batting average on balls in play. Pitchers just throw him down the middle of the zone here. Because what do you do? He's gonna he's gonna hit the ball for the uh, for the most part here. So you see seeing you know, some offside off off speed pitches. But when you look at that lineup with Simeon, uh, Corey Seager, and then um, Nate Lau is gonna hit third with Adolis Garcia backing him up at four. You have to pitch to the guy. You can't throw. You can't cut the corners or throw too far outside or anything like that. And so um, he is going to see pitches to hit, and he seems to be handling them very, very well. So uh, a, a complete fall off or anything like that to two forty, two fifty. I don't see that. He's gonna get pitches to hit, and he's certainly proven that he can handle that. And so it's kind of interesting as a lefty. He hit three thirty against. Other lefties. And typically, you see the righty lefty splits uh, a little bit different, but he had 290 against righties as a lefty, so he really came on strong against the lefties, which is a bit unusual. And he did better on the road, 322 average versus 280 at uh, at at home. So home versus lefties, 388, just just killed him. So uh, if you're doing the daily fantasy, look for a lefty, look for him playing at home, and uh, and there you go. And it allows your not that's your value play right there. Um, away versus righties did very well. So. Um, the 350 average, very uh, very unusual metrics here for the most part. And he was a second half player. He had a very good start at the beginning of the year, but towards the end of the year, um, or towards the middle, he fell off just a little bit, but heated up again in in August and for the year. Um, that second half was uh, overall much better than the first half, and so um, if you can put together a decent first half again, maybe the regression isn't isn't going to be much of much of anything here. So again, he's seeing fewer fastballs, he's seeing more sliders, and the uh, and the changeups are coming down as well. And so uh, they're trying to pitch him within the zone. He's getting fastballs, but they're throwing some strikeout pitches, and this is where you see that chase rate. And you're getting more sliders that start in the zone and then move outside. And uh, he does kind of swing at those a little bit. So if he if he learns to handle those and gets that outside contract outside contact number uh, under control a little bit, or the outside swing percentage under control, then I think we're uh, then I think we're going to have a, a a more complete hitter here, more consistently. Com last year was pretty complete, more consistently complete hitter for the most part. And so uh, Dallas Garcia. Uh, he's he's kind of like Nate Lau actually, but uh, he has a lot more strikeouts, and so they they don't feel uh, as threatened by him. So it'll be up to Dallas a little bit as well. You can see what he's done over the past couple of years since 2019. The the uh, the weighted on base average for major leaguers has uh, has kind of diverged and come off a, a few ticks here. While Nate Lau has actually really really improved, and in, uh, in terms of relative to other first basemen in the American League, in terms of weighted runs created, he was the number one guy. So if you just look at the bat. This was your best first baseman in the uh, in the league last year. So um, Anthony Rizzo and uh, Vlad had the home runs, but uh, combined the average um, for uh, for Nate Lau and uh, looks pretty good. Now the defense is going to hold him back from those six seven win seasons, and so longer term that makes him you maybe not the greatest uh, investment in the world here. So uh, the first thing that uh, first player that kind of came to mind when I was looking at all this was Brandon Belt. And so when you think about that really good type uh, major league player, but maybe not great. You think Brandon Belt, so he could have an excellent real career here. He could have some very, very serviceable uh, seasons fantasy-wise or if you're buying his cards. But I think you'd want to have an extra strategy before everything is said and done. Joey Votto is kind of your, uh, you know, he's got the MVP, uh, the fan favorite. But he, I would consider to be a kind of a low-end Hall of Famer for the most part. You know, just sitting under 60 wins above replacement. Uh, what is he, around 2,000 hits or less? I mean, just not Hall of Fame numbers, but because he is so liked and because he has the MVP, um, he's a little bit more on the fence than not. So if you look at a Brandon Belt, who's probably not getting in, and you look at what Nate Lau is doing, I mean, he's tracking kind of in there. So again, that long-term generational path, I'm not quite seeing it here. And that's reflect reflected in his card prices. If you're looking at his Bowman first autographs, you can get the, the, the regular for, you know, the base for, you know, 10, 20 bucks. And some of the refractors, numbered refractors, higher end things, they'll run you a couple hundred dollars where if he was a 23-year-old or 22-year-old doing this, they'd be a few thousand dollars. So I think the prices reflect um, that he's a very good player. He's going to have some years where he can do some things with his stuff. But in the uh, in the overall long term, um, you, you'd want to exit unless you're a, a correct unless you're a, a an Alau correct 
collector. So um, again, you don't want to be holding the bag on these huge, huge cards at the uh, at the end of the day. So that's what I got for you. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please like and subscribe if you do, and we will talk to you later.